Joel Smolin and Jeet Vogler. Uh, they're, they're two workers who work in Apple quite a lot, that is here. Um, and essentially, uh, we set out to give the world you knew about general relativity and cosmology. What could we come up with as the best, most reasonable explanation for the anomalous accommodation of the galaxy within Einstein's original theory without dark energy? And what I'm going to show you today is what we came up with. Uh, maybe it's not right, maybe it's right, maybe it's explaining it, but to us this is very compelling and it's hard to imagine this does not have a lot to do, maybe not everything to do with the measurement of the anomalous acceleration, but you do the guess. Okay, uh, maybe I'll just say in words what the whole picture is. So here's the picture. Um, if there is no dark energy, then it's reasonable, or I thought it was at the beginning, maybe the anomalous acceleration is caused by a wave. So somehow we're at the center, or near the center, of a very large expansion wave that uh, maybe is under dense expansion. That's a standard model. So the standard model is uniform. Now there's a small under density where the center could pull apart. And that pulling apart causes an anomalous acceleration without actually having to put an extra term in the equation to create that apparent acceleration. So we thought, well, how would you find such a wave? And we had a shock wave theory of putting a shock wave in cosmology. We thought, well, maybe the secondary wave reflected off the shock wave might create such a, an expansion wave. But then when we were working on that, we realized these are natural one-parameter families of self-similar perturbations of the standard model would naturally create these when the universe is filled with radiation and the pressure would be normal and you'd expect to get decay the simple wave patterns like these self-similar waves. So then we set, off, set out to see what happens uh, after the pressure drops to zero, what happens to these perturbations? Could what, what these create during radiation create something like an anomalous acceleration at a later time? And that's when we discovered something really, uh, we think, Remarkable, and that is that these waves trigger an instability in the standard model when the pressure drops to zero. An instability is the same character as a pendulum on the Earth. It's an unstable saddle rest point, and the effect of the perturbation then near the center would the phase forces. When you do it in the right equation, there's a, a wonderful uncoupling of the equations around the center, and the center, this instability creates a uniformly expanding constant density space field uh, that mimics very, very closely the effect of dark energy. And the phase portrait shows the uh, perturbations of this unstable saddle rest point following a trajectory into a stable rest point, which is the time mass and product of the perturbation. And during the trajectory to that rest point uh, near the center, it looks just like dark energy, or, or uniform Friedman space time with dark energy. That's a lock function. So one of the conclusions is, if it's unstable, why would you ever expect to measure the redshift versus luminosity relation of the standard model anyway? You should expect to, to measure uh, acceleration. OK, so that's the introduction. Um, now let me just start the talk here. So, and, the, and I'm assuming, you know, everyone here doesn't know cosmology, so I'll try and put this in the context of cosmology, tell you uh, what our results are, summarize them, then I'm going to flash through the details, uh, which are, if you want to look at them on, when we post the talk, that's fine, and then I'll give some conclusions, hopefully all within an hour. Okay, so, starting. So, in 1999, observations of redshift versus luminosity for type 1a supernova in nearby galaxies won the Nobel Prize because they discovered the anomalous acceleration. The universe is expanding faster than the standard model of cosmology, uh, based on a Friedman space time, uh, allows. And the only way to preserve the cosmological principle, which is that on the largest length scale, the universe is described by a Friedman space time, which holds no special place, is to add a cosmological constant, the term invented by Einstein, to as a source term for the equation. And this anti-gravitational term pulls things apart faster, creating a faster expansion wave at Friedman. Now if you do a best fit 
among Friedman spacetimes with dark energy, with the cosmological constant, you get the conclusion that the universe is a critical, flat at every time, phase from zero, Friedman spacetime, with 70% dark energy. Omega lambda is 0.7. That's the best fit. Now we're going to compare our numbers not to the data, but we're going to compare them to what is the best fit. So we never actually look at the data. We're thinking about the data now. Okay, so just the history of how this happened. Uh, in 2007, I actually gave a talk in this rel relativity session at the AMS National Meeting in New Orleans, and that's where we proposed this idea that a simple wave from the radiation weapons might be accounted for the enormous acceleration of the galaxy without dark energy, and that's when we set out to find this wave. And our motivation was that during radiation, after inflation, so about 30,000 years after the Big Bang, in fact, at about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, is the uncoupling of radiation from matter, and that's when we see the micro and cosmic radiation. At uh, one order of magnitude before that, the pressure in the standard model dropped precipitously to zero from speed to speed accelerated very low. And so, but the pressure here is essentially the relativistic speed system with an enormous sound speed during the radiation epoch. So we thought, this is how we started, uh, pure radiation, the equation was stage rho is at to the fourth t is c squared over three rho, the sound speed of t over the square root of three, it's over half the speed of light. Uh, all, everyone who knows conservation laws, which <coughs> means that contact discontinuity that flows out all the nonlinear fields leads to decay, and you'd expect to get decay to simple wave forms just from conservation laws. So that's how we started. So we said maybe it's reasonable to expect that fluctuations would decay to simple wave patterns at the end of the radiation epoch. That was our starting point. So here's the standard model of seismology in a simple nutshell. Inflation, we're not going to worry about that. Comes in about 10 to the negative 30 seconds after the Big Bang. Just to discuss that a little bit about that. That is the pressure for uh, pure radiation, which is also the the basic formula of free particles, t is c squared over 3 rho, which means a constant times rho. Uh, that's the epic. And we're thinking, what if a wave crystallized or formed during this period, what would it end up being? Now, what we discover is actually, it doesn't really matter what the wave is, the mean stability is very independent of what the wave is. But let's, we didn't know that. Let's see how that comes out. So pursuing this idea, we discovered that there's only one way the Einstein equation can both perturb the Friedman space time and also reduce the ODEs, uh, maximum wave energy response ODEs, from T is C squared over 3 rho. And we ran into this family of solutions just kind of milling around. And we were pretty excited because they were exactly what we were looking for. So we identified a one parameter family of pulse similar waves that perturb the standard model during the radiation epoch. And we proposed that these might induce an anomalous acceleration of the Gibbs response. And we analyzed these waves to death. Uh, we published them to NAS and uh, everything we wanted to know about them in the memoirs in, in 2011. So our interest in these waves was the connection between these waves and a possible anomalous acceleration. But in fact, we found these waves were not. They were already discovered from another point of view in, uh, in this incredibly interesting paper of Cahill and Taub in 1971. He's a fine mathematician at Berkeley. Uh, that's great. Uh, and other people have, have thought about pulse similar waves. So our interest was in how, how they might connect to the anomalous acceleration problem. So then around 2007, other groups started exploring. Maybe we live in a large underdensity, and this accounts for the anomalous acceleration. In 2009, uh, we saw this cover article in Scientific American. That's my lifestyle. It's great. So, but, but nobody, we've been through the record, nobody before has proposed this family of waves as a mechanism that could account for the anomalous acceleration. That's what we did, and we pursued it to the conclusion, which I'm showing you right now. So we've accomplished the goal of bringing the, the effects of these perturbations of the standard model, we think of them as waves, uh, up to the present time to compare with dark energy. And there are several surprises. And I'd like to tell you what the surprises are. And so first I'm going to give you the, the bullet points, and then we'll go back and uh, try to convince you that uh, 
if you didn't get to answer, you got to your full opening statement. All right. Okay, so the first thing is, when the pressure drops to zero, we identify an instability at the center of the perturbation that's based on a new closed asymptotic onset for local perturbation is a critical indicator in the sensing group. The instability naturally creates a central region of accelerated uniform expansion on the scale of the supernova data within Einstein's original theory of outside energy. And physically, what's going on is very simple. If there's an underdensity, there's less gravity to hold the center in. So the center starts expanding outward. Now, what's remarkable is that every perturbation near the center involves a person in the same phase plate. There's a universal phase plate that's described in this. And to get the phase plate, this we need to know you have to have coordinate perturbation that's smooth at the center. And that's what's being referred to as coordinate smooth. Other people work in the Tolman, uh, in uh, Lamotte, Tolman Bondi coordinates where they use the radial coordinate as coordinates of co moving. And in these coordinates, uh, phase coordinates on couple in a very nice way. Uh, the phase port then is universal in the sense that it describes every smooth surface with a specific perturbation near the center when t is zero. Now you think about it, why does this work? It works because when the pressure is zero, there's only one sound peak. So when everything's going out, all the waves are moving outward. There's nothing essentially coming back in to change the development of the solution at the center. If you try to play this game during radiation when the pressure is large, you see that the asymptotic equations don't close. Higher up, they close within the onlet, but they don't close. Higher order terms keep coming into the lower order equations. Kind of like uh, Brad's theory of moments. You can't close up the equation. T is zero. There's no closing. It's pretty nice. And the region of accelerated uniform expansion is one order of magnitude larger in this thing than you would naively expect when you started. So uh, the instability is triggered by our time asymptotic perturbations of the scanner model from the radiation weapon. Those perturbations trigger it. And surprisingly, uh, it's not the perturbation what we thought in our previous work, but we thought it was the perturbation at the end of the radiation essentially that continues passively out and creates an anomalous acceleration, not the center. It's the phase port that at the instability is triggered that causes an anomalous acceleration. And in fact, it turns around <laughs> with the, actually with the opposite area of the planet. Uh, so, okay. So here's the phase portrait. My goal is to describe why is this the phase portrait for these perturbations. So here's a picture of it. This is the density, and this is the velocity looking outward from the center. The standard model for an end of perturbation is this unstable catalytic of the origin. The dotted line is the projection of the one parameter family of perturbations from the radiation, so it's at the initial data and at the end of radiation projected into this central region. Uh, a small perturbation sends the solution out along this trajectory. And this is the Minkowski space. The whole center is tending, it's going to flatter and flatter and tend to the Minkowski space. And while you move along this orbit, it reproduces very closely the effects of dark energy. So here's another picture. Where, where are we? Uh, well, I'm going to put it right here. I'm almost way out here near that stable rest point. Uh, that's the place where the Hubble constant matches the observed Hubble constant. And if you compare with dark energy, we have the same quadratic correction to redshift curve that you see now for rare dark energy. And the third order correction is a prediction of the theory that is in principle regular. So this region of accelerated uniform expansion introduces, this is kind of blue at the light, so you saw this, you hope you're kind of amazed at this. It induces exactly the same range of quadratic corrections for redshift curve to luminosity, as does the cosmological constant in the theory of dark energy. As you go through this phase portrait, the quadratic correction for redshift curve to luminosity is expect to observe 0.25, and the observed 0.425, and the sample 0.5, that's the same range. Dark energy gives you exactly the same range as this wave did. Yet, only 0.4, you're pretty much screwed, but it's 0.5. Um, yeah, so that's the same range as the quadratic corrections for redshift versus luminosity in the standard model. You'd expect to observe 0.25 always. But uh, the specific model <coughs> gives you 0.425, and dark energy says what it intended was 0.5. Same as the radiation, same 
not clear about that. The result leads naturally to a testable alternative to dark energy within Einstein's original theory without cosmological constant. So here's our proposal. The anomalous acceleration is due to the local underdense perturbation of the standard model on the scale of the supernova data arising from time-lapse sympathetic perturbations of the standard model from the radiation hit that triggered an instability, a spherical instability in the standard model and affected the optical data. So if you do the calculation, the prediction is if dark energy is there, let's just say if it's dark energy, it's 70% dark energy, predict the redshift is luminosity distance, Hubble constant, redshift, there's the Hubble law before you can look far from the center. So you start looking back in time, you pick up corrections, the standard model says you should see 0.25 years, 70% dark energy says you get 0.425 years. If you move along this orbit until you reach the point 0.425, which is the limit that you can reach it because you can get 0.425, the correction here is positive, here it's negative, there's a difference in the theory, and there's a little slightly. I also want to say this, we're not trying to solve all of the problems in seismology. Well, we'd like to, that'd be great. We're not, we're just looking at the anomalous acceleration problem and interpreting this instability in the model. And the model, I think, stands on its own, independent of how we set other measurements in. To accommodate other measurements, we need further assumptions beyond the center. So that's, those are the bullet points. Okay, so now just for a quick, put it in a historical context, here's a quick introduction to seismology so that you can know this is just not some crazy stuff. Okay, 1979, Hubble's law. Apparently you see the Hubble. The galaxies are receiving from us at a velocity proportional to the distance the universe is expanding. It's based on redshift versus luminosity. There's a largest length scale in the universe, these baryonic acoustic scales. This largest length scale is about a half a billion light years across. Everything gets pretty spherical there. And so the standard model assumes that beyond this scale of about a twentieth of the way across the visible universe, that the universe is uniform. And it's described by a Friedman space time. Now if we're going to work with this variable C, which is going to be the radial distance that the outcome center divided by time since the Big Bang, or the speed of distance of light travel since the Big Bang, and that's a measure of how far out across the universe you are. When C is one, you're at the horizon distance, you can't see any further. So at this scale, one over twentieth, this is about C equals 0.05. We're going to expand it to C. So it's pretty small at this baryonic acoustic scale. Now, so what's the real quick length scale? Ten billion light years is the visible minimum. If the universe is 14.15 billion years old, about ten billion years of light travel gives you ten billion light years out to the edge. Five hundred million light years, that's the scale of the baryonic acoustic scale. So beyond that, it's pretty much uniform. Inside that scale, 50 million light years, that's the separation between clusters of galaxies. Lovely. Ten million light years is diameter of a cluster of galaxies. A million light years separation between galaxies in a cluster. A hundred thousand light years distance across the Milky Way. And then you add 28,000 light years to the galactic center. Now you can convert light year into redshift. Redshift measures how far away you are. And so one plus V is the ratio of the scale factor in the Friedman space time. So the redshift factor in the Friedman space time, when C is zero, it's a two-thirds growth rate. So if you can plug in that C is a tenth of the way across the universe, because the redshift factor goes out to V is about 0.07. So a tenth of the distance of all the radius is about V is 0.07. And say when the redshift factor is one, you're about a third of the way across the universe, just for setting the scale then, because we're going to look at redshift and speed. Okay, so 1922, Alexander Friedman found these solutions to the Einstein equation. And the result is that when you take a brief space of constant curvature, uh, you roll them in time. And the theory of the Big Bang based on this was uh, worked out by George Lamarckian and uh, Hubble and others. 
and at the Institute of Hubble Talk Center to expansion rates. And they actually said there's a principle here. The Earth is not in a perfect place in the universe. So each, well, the year, and if the universe is homogeneous and isotropic about every point, it has to be a Friedman universe. So it's sort of like used sometimes in cosmology as a principle of physics to deal with much of uniform. Well, maybe not. Maybe they're lying near the center of an enormous underdensity or something. I don't know. But at any rate, let's keep going. Now, observations of the background radiation, everyone takes K to be essentially zero. So we're going to assume that the universe is flat at any time. These uh, perturbations are a natural mechanism that introduce flatness into uh, the cosmology because the uh, essential perturbations are always coming with more and more flatness. So anyway, that's kind of interesting. I don't know whether whatever was originally from Christ and why would we even look at that? Why would Christ be here? Okay, so here's the metric, R is T times T. Uh, it's Euclidean free space. This is flat free space in spherical coordinates. R is T is the speeding. So it's easy to do uh, the Hubble law. Uh, you might want to keep in mind that capital R times little r is distance at fixed time in the Friedman space time. R is the radial variable. It's just being scaled by R. And so the distance is capital R times little r. So the distance between two galaxies at the same time would be e to the minus e to the r. And r stays constant on the galaxy, so you get an infinite centrifugal radius with the separation distance of those from e. So that's the original model of our Hubble law. So if you follow this backwards, uh, the equation shows there's a big bang that happens approximately uh, 1 over the Hubble uh, constant for time. Uh, that's a big bang. Okay. Now, uh, the Hubble length or the Hubble radius, 1 over h is the h of the units, but c over h naught, that's a measure of how big the um, distance of light travel since the big bang. So that, we're going to call that the Hubble radius, and that's about 10 to the 10 radius. That's at the scale of how far you are from Earth. Now, you actually can't measure at fixed time. You're measuring the redshift. So you're always looking backwards in time. So in fact, when you measure luminosity to measure the distance, the redshift, to measure the expansion rate, uh, you look backwards in time. You pick up these uh, higher order terms in a relationship between the luminosity, distance, and redshift. And the standard model, if you just do the expansion, you see it's just falling to quarter and just wait when the pressure is zero. Now, until 1999, uh, the law of simply the linear relation was known, but when you could look out farther, you start picking up these other terms. Uh, this isn't exactly how uh, the supernova data has been interpreted, but we're going to view it this way because we know what their best fit is, and we're going to compare what we have to the best fit. So let's look at these examples. Uh, how, what is h0? It's about 100 kilometers per second, 10 megaparsecs. Uh, it's 3.2 million light years, so these galaxies are speeding at about 100 kilometers per second. So that's, that's the expansion rate that this unit has. Okay. So the data, they discovered that uh, there's a expansion. There's like a negative pressure. And so this has led to the introduction of dark energy because the best fit for the data among Friedman space times the cosmological constant is cosmological constant about 0.7. So from our point of view, they're not measuring the quarter here. And I'm told, so we're looking into this now, so what I'm saying is I don't know whether this measure, this term is in the data. Do you think it might actually be? That would be a prediction if it is, but we can tell you even so far that. So, okay, so the best fit is k equals 0, omega lambda equals 0.7, that's the best fit to the data. So if you look at, we've been talking to this uh, astrophysicist, Dr. Larry Wilson, at Duke at, in U of M astronomy, and he gave us this nice plot of uh, the supernova data. So just to plot, uh, this is redshift, notice the redshift at 0.01 here, tenth of the way. plot these guys, and so you play around with uh, what's the best fit, and the standard model would be everything matter, nothing uh, cosmological constant, and uh, 
So let's just quick go through uh, how that works. Well, uh, the Einstein equations, which are you know, so famous, are E equal to root h by t, kappa t. Uh, all the experiments in relativity that confirm this theory, including gravity waves, they don't require any extra term here. Except for one, cosmology requires an extra term. So here's if you plot the Friedman space on either of these equations, you get two equations. And, uh, Evolution. H is water pressure, L is the density, T is the pressure. If you say how T depends on rho, then you can uh, eliminate H and you just get how it just goes up and you solve for rho. So the solution, the growth rate, uh, cancel rate depends on the phase of space. Now when you put uh, dark energy in, you add this term. And what do you add there? To the equation. And in that case, when you plug the Friedman on back into the equation, you get similar equations, except that lambda uh, is over here in the equation. Now, uh, the lambda is constant. If you divide this equation by root squared, you pick up this omega lambda, and here's omega matter, so it's the sum of them is one, and the, the, the uh, value is evolving time. So the best fit is omega lambda is one second, Omega matter is time space. Now, if I do that much slowly, uh, maybe I'll have to finish by this, but I like to do it this anyway. You write this as the rho and the lambda divide. That's a constant. Rho, on the other hand, is decreasing from an enormous value down to basically zero at the end. And so you divide by h squared, you get that's omega lambda. Uh, that is omega matter. Clearly, the sum is one, and so you can conclude the omega lambda starts out zero at the end of radiation, essentially zero, and heads toward one. Heads two down from the end of radiation to infinity, and we're at the point of Z plus seven. Now this is a little bit of a fine tuning because in order to get the the fit here, the omega lambda has to be on the order of omega matter in order to get the data to look like the Friedman space time with dark energy, so you have to be in the window where this is on the order of this. So that's a little fine tuning in the theory. That's similar to the fine tuning of thinking in your center of a sphere basis, where both of them are constant. Okay, so there's the best fit. And uh, uh, here's the dark space from the wild dark, dark energy, from the dark, dark energy on the Malta website. That's the point of this one. Where we are. So we asked, uh, maybe we're right, maybe we're wrong, we're allowed to ask this question, and we did. Could the anomalous acceleration of the galaxy be due to the fact that we're looking probably in an expansion ray of the space during the radiation epoch of the Big Bang? The Einstein equations have been confirmed in every setting except cosmology without the need for that constant, but an expansion ray that typically has a constant. So here's a summary of the results. Okay. I'm just going to go through this a little more carefully to show you how we got there. Uh, here's, there's the Hubble again. There's the space we came on out to. Uh, and the question is, what's the correction? You could view the supernova data in gravitational waves as a correction. Uh, so the Einstein equation gives a cosmological constant. Uh, and if you put it in, they measure this. Gives that. Okay? That's the right thing. So, we want to show the expander model is unstable. Small wave perturbation at the end of radiation more expanded, here, but not as usual. It accelerated uniform expansion at the center of the wave, which induces exactly the same range of quadratic corrections for redshift versus linear motion, and therefore dark energy. How does that, uh, how does that work? And we also want to see how it connects to the perturbation. Radiation. Okay, so these go through the same range. All right, so here's how it works. Uh, dark energy, if you write down the Friedman space time with omega lambda as the parameter, um, in this coefficient, uh, it's easy to see that's the quadratic direction, and this is the cubic direction. So you can see 
So it's not exactly the incidental one. It's not specific enough. It's just a measure that has physical meaning or a particular point in mind. And then C is the analog squared. That's our dimension of density. WZ over C is the dimension of velocity. And I made this comment. It's only a, it's a measure in an underdense solution. But we call it the fractional distance or however you want. It's whatever sense of where you want it. But only even powers apply. So Z starts out at T squared. There is no T term. And this space down here is correct as to what it is. These are the points, which are pretty small. And I have to see the descent curve to even tell you. So what's interesting that really grabs us here is that in this ontos, C squared is R squared over C squared. And Z is rho R squared. When the R squared can't lie, you can call it the rho of Z. And what's likely to know is you're going to have a constant density of uniform strength, which drops in value at F of T over T squared. The standard model drops by T squared. There's a head towards the left side. It comes in just perfectly. So instead of getting exponential decay, you get cubic decay. And that's what prevents the density pulling apart faster, like an effect of dark energy. So the theorem, the slug is just on us. There isn't the Einstein equation. So what could the ODE that solves this equation? And you end up with the up going up in fourth order energy, second order density, used in the equation. First of all, the Einstein equation flows on the even powers of C, no matter what, in standard Poisson formula. But here, these two equations close up to a higher order center effect that's been used in these equations. And I mentioned the bad energy decay. Let me just keep going. Now, if you did this for pure radiation, it flows with an even power of C. But these two equations always involve higher order terms, like W2, V4. These will essentially reflect on the fact that there are waves coming back in, affecting the solution over time. When C is 0, energy is going out. And it's still coming back in. The solution is a little bit closed. But its center is doing something universal. So in our wave theory, we plug into these equations. Those two equations close up. And you get the two ODEs that describe the lead and learn density and the lead and learn W. And you do a calculation of redshift versus luminosity, correctly doing the right terms. These calculations are a lot of arithmetic in them. They all want to pay. There's a lot of calculations. And those are, as we all end up paying 20 pages of calculations. But you have to make sure every single one is right. So every one of them needs a second check. And we just need now a second check on everything. So we're really very confident every one of these numbers is right. Now here, this one isn't so bad. We can get the cubic distance if we want to. I'll show you. And so that is this guy as a phase portrait. So that's the phase portrait. And Q has a formula based on only depend on the v2 and the w0. So you just plug that formula in. If you look at this formula, you can see that both contain two parts, two free parts, the phase and the energy. So for no reason, apparently, as far as I can see, there's no reason that they quadruple it. Now, yes, so it goes between those two values. You get entropy for rho and rho. And in under density, where I tell you the yard here becomes 435, that becomes 435. You get the difference for rho as well. That's our prediction. So this is a cartoon of the phase portrait. I'll show it to you again. The standard model is an unstable channel S in the near the center, where the left end of T is a fourth in the density area. It's just looking like a rho of T evolving in time. That rho of T has along this orbit becoming flatter and flatter until the time goes to infinity, which is a constant point, which is cubic. And now, if you take the self-similar wave and put the initial data in at IPH, where the equation is settling, you discover it cuts between the stable and unstable point clouds here. You get a small perturbation. It turns it into an underdense reaction, which is pulled off along this orbit and creates even longer acceleration in the center. So the strategy, then, is to use our equation to evolve the initial data for these A waves at the end of radiation. So you've got to get the data in the right period. Put in the parameter A and the starting temperature. Temperature goes about from 0 to 8,000 degrees up until about 10 to 30,000 years after the Big Bang. 
to understand and monitor the pressure drops we're doing. Let's read about the calculation. It's like completely independent of the system. All it depends on is A. It's very, very intensive as to where you want the pressure drop to be at any given moment. So when we do that, if we're, we, uh, the simulation shows there's no dependence on the initial time in that range. So we need only compute the value of the acceleration parameter, the perturbation, that gives the correct phenomenon for acceleration. And we do that numerically to say there's an ending event. Uh, if A is 1 as a standard level, it's several points for the divergence depending on where you put the point. Uh, that's what gives you the point 4 and 2 pi nearly exponential divergence. This corresponds to a relative ease of view of uh, something like any other exponent of one point. So small underbenching creates a big change in the solution. The standard model is unstable and never going to measure it. We want to give measure of something that's going to have any effect. So here's another picture. Here's the A equals A bar, the underbenching, which takes off along this orbit, goes to the stable rest point, creating the acceleration proportion at this point. Because in the universe, it gives you the correct quadratic correction associated with that energy where it is over the rest point. And I think I said that an under density of 10 to the negative 6 at the end of radiation goes to uh, 1 7. By the time you reach uh, the present time and you get the Hubble constant and the right uh, quadratic correction for dark energy, so the standard model is significantly unstable. Uh, it's a sevenfold under density. So I conclude the standard model is unstable to local spherical perturbation of the time parameter family. So wait and make a prediction again of dark energy. If you can look out far enough, you're going to see more phenomena of acceleration in those two than you'll see in the uh, dark energy two. So that's essentially it. But now, uh, so let me tell you more now. Neglecting the C to the fourth errors, the spacetime here in the center looks almost exactly like a speeded up Friedman spacetime. And we can prove the metric tends to present the effect. The flattening Kautsky state, which is not co-moving with the fluid, but the evolution creates a uniformly expanding constant density solution in the central region. And it's better independent if you neglect relativistic effects. It doesn't matter where you are. And within that asymptotic, you're going to see the same redshift versus mean velocity relation. So it's kind of a robust thing. And the numerics show that the higher order terms of c to the fourth, you can change them more than once. It doesn't seem to change the, the redshift versus mean velocity relation. So you can have it justify the state. Now, so the wave creates a uniformly expanding space time of an anomalous acceleration in a large flat center independent region near the center of the wave. This is a mechanism for creating flatness out of the non-flatness. I'll make this one picture of the gun wave. So it happens when you neglect the fourth order terms here. And this part of it is an exact solution. If you view this as exact, following the equations that are exact, it looks almost exactly like dark energy. Now it's interesting, the rest point comes in vertically. If it came in in any direction other than vertically, the density would drop exponentially. But the density, being the horizontal axis, is dropping algebraically. So what happens is, as you head towards the rest point, the density drops by Q3, plus an exponential change in Y, the standard model, just like going at a speed of Q squared, <coughs> that's the anomalous acceleration of the value. So, the so here's the theorem. The unique value of the acceleration parameter, such that the p equals zero evolution, starting from the initial data, from the self similar wave at that point, uh, evolves to h equals h minus q equals point four two pi at some time greater time t equals t naught, in agreement with dark energy, that t dark energy is the age of the universe in dark energy, t naught is the age in the wave theory. The cubic correction, which is on a different sign, but is on the same orbit, and, and as I said, you don't seem to be very much affected by the higher order of things. You want to be near the Friedman term. The central region uh, tends to be reproducing those numbers very helpfully. And the ages of the universe are very close. They're 95 percent of the dark energy age with the wave pace. 
Okay, now around 2007, other groups began exploring the possibility that the anomalous acceleration might be due to a flying in a large amount of density. So we, we wondered why weren't they funding it? They were still taken seriously. I wanted to put this up uh, the NASA physicist who, who we trust and who, who sang her, uh, the, um, she sang her disagreement during the Hubble Speed Project on the supernova measurements of the Hubble Constant. The mass combined from the sky crater could be the indication that we live in an undergrass region whose size and magnitude would be difficult to reconcile with the lambda CDM, the lambda cold dark matter, with Gaussian initial perturbations to create the, that the uh, baryonic acoustic cloud and that's part of the theory that it doesn't matter when you put it into that. So it's not clear. And there are large scale anisotropies in the background radiation. So the universe is not perfectly uniform. Okay, now, so, and I gave this talk before, I said, I'm going to give you the details, and I'm going to give them to you at the speed of light. I'm just going to run through these, okay, here, and I'll just tell you how it works, so you get an idea of what the ultimate point is going to be. So you just listen to my words, you won't pay attention. <laughs> so, so here are the steps. First, you derive a new formulation for the t equals zero Einstein equation, and you see t coordinates using uh, standard Schwarzschild coordinates instead of these... Uh, Yamata and Coleman boundary coordinates. Uh, we propose a new onset for a correction to the standard model in these equations. We put the we construct the initial data from these A waves and put it in the right gauge so that we can evolve them by the equations that go with the onset. And then we calculate the redshift versus linear velocity relation for those corrections. And these are really fast. We start out with standard Schwarzschild coordinates, every spherical geometric metric here is local science and generically we transform the standard Schwarzschild coordinates so there's no real loss of generality there. Here are the equations uh, in spherical symmetry and only looking at spherical perturbations. <coughs> uh, we pick this t equals zero as the fluid equation. We vary the two metric equations along and we substitute into the equation. We find these nice variables and we keep going and we keep going. We change the variables to t and t and we get the following So we then get the W and the V as the maximum of quantity. So then uh, we keep going. Then second step, we create an onset which involves even powers of everything. Even powers of everything. At the end, I'm just going to tell you that just means that the <coughs> space time is smooth with respect to the, the curve that passed through R equals zero, the singularity of these spherical coordinate systems. All this is doing is telling us relative to the coordinates. The geometry is represented in the spaces for the coordinates. How can we lose when we spin the time equation? So then, to involve even powers of C, so you plug them in. You take that part on that. You plug them in. And they're actually the same happens. So three of those equations drop out because their identities, because they're in a really nice gauge, uh, and things get better. Uh, at the end of radiation, you're not in that gauge, so you've got to massage the data to do the matching to get the gauge where it holds. I'm not going to say too much about that, but you plug it in, and you get the system of equations, which, uh, here it is, has great Laplanian, great linear <coughs> Laplanian. I mean, that's the kind of work. Rho to rho t is here, is up here, but you just go to log time, you need a mass to make the Laplanian, and the whole thing is like this universal, canonical, Laplanian system of equations and the Laplace measures. It's creative. And so because you can do this log time, there's a really large time problem to figure in that. Okay, so let's keep going here. And then I did most of this, the phase force that you plug it in, you do the, the guys uh, who have to do the stuff from the waves, but uh, I'm just telling you here, we have to change, we have to post-process the initial data because that gauge where those relationships between the A's and the V's and the V's, the metric components are going to jump out cold. But you, there's no hope in the standard model either because you're not matching them in co-moving coordinates. You're matching them in kind of weird uh, standard Schwarzschild coordinates because in the radius, you do the area of the field symmetry. So it's, it's co-moving. Isn't it better than co-moving? It's good. So then you you uh, have you can do a time change because time, your, your SOT metric onset has a gain speed. You can't replace it. So you 
and just need to realize what that data is able to start to conduct. And we know that it's directed to the port exactly the same way as the external port. So that's sort of like a perfect check. So you get this initial table, which says, here's our initial time. And then you get these new hats. But the problem is, here's the temperature. Uh, we know that the, uh, at least under the temperature drop to zero on a constant energy surface, which, unlike the Friedman spectrum, is not the same as the constant time surface. So you have to pull this back to a constant time. And when you pull it back to a constant time, you get the initial data. And here's the, all the gammas that are involved in this. The ends and so there's the initial data. Now we can just plug that data into the computer and we've all this. OK, but we need formulas for the redshift versus luminosity along this orbit. So when you put this in, it was a little bit of a struggle for us to get here. Because we didn't have to draw it and draw it. But uh, <coughs> the answer is, uh, when you, you have to put in all the effects that add to redshift versus luminosity. So you draw all the effects here. They keep coming down, 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 down. And the formula uh, is, uh, well, that is the formula. E1 is, so E3 is 2I2 plus I3. I2 involves H2 W0. Uh, I3 makes W0. But then H2 involves this V2. And then you keep adding the more and more terms. And finally, every one of these terms is non-zero in the standard model. So that's another double check on this, that you have to get the same you have to get the right answer in the standard model to be looking at that VS. And so that's a double check there. Uh, then this data, you just plot it and it puts between the stable and unstable manifold there. And then we can compare it with the standard model. So the dark energy, I explained how you calculate this. Maybe that's not so helpful. That's not how you calculate. Um, so how do you determine the acceleration parameter that gives you the correct data? that send you along the orbit so that you're at a point where the Hubble constant agrees with the standard model and the quadratic correction agrees with the correction for dark energy. Well, you just simulate them all until you find them. You just keep simulating. How you find in the simulation doesn't depend on the setting temperature. It doesn't matter what it's doing. It only matters the acceleration parameter. So that also tells you nothing to do about getting out of zero to zero. Only the end is going to be the constant E bar. And so the answer is there's this magic number A bar, which is quite pleasant right here. That's the one that works. And then, okay, so continue, continuing along here, um, got this blow up picture of where we are in the universe in this model. And we plug that. And the standard model is unstable. There's the theorem that gives the sign on the top of the thing. OK, now near the center, the flat. Oh, this is an exact solution. You're, look, you're neglecting those higher order terms. You've got an exact uniform in the standard spectrum. It looks a lot like a cube in the Friedman spectrum with the hooks to that S thing. So we showed that uh, it is very uniform and independent of center as you zero in on that rest point. And the one over C cubed to stay in the density is the effect. Right, I'll explain in a minute. But when we first did this, we thought of these uh, perturbations as being special because we got all of the even powers and everything out of this radiation way that we weren't really thinking what this meant. Uh, maybe we could have thought about it, but uh, as, as we started thinking about it, we want a radio expected function as a smooth function in the Friedman coordinates. Uh, we have p of x, and that's like a reacting variable. Is that when you differentiate the function acting along these uh, even powers in order to be smooth, you just get the, the radius. So that means you get expansions of even powers. So if you start with, say, uh, the standard Schwarzschild coordinates and you write the, the, the extension of r equal zero as a singular point, so you could have a singularity in r equal zero in the singular. But if you just write this down to see that if a is expanded in even powers, the coordinate is smooth with respect to our point, then radio gives you the speed of center. And then, so that says, we can see that our ansatz is really just expressing smoothness at r equals zero in s of c coordinates. So that says that anything that starts with this ansatz, if it's smooth, it's universal even if the event source is in the center. So you can have this 
be procured by these ladies because they're property of the U.S. Department. So that same person, in that sense, is a university for the benefits. Is the required things for absolute loyalty or Ms. Smith is supposed to have the dependents and things like that. So we sent our paper to the Proceedings of the Royal Society and it's still under review there. And the editor said, you have to address all reports on the Lamarckism and Bonner children. And so we haven't really thought about this. We have to do that. But he sent us a list of reference. And here are the references. So we went through all these references. We sent over all of them. And we did. We went through them. We didn't read any of them. So we went through them. And then we wondered, well, one of them did this. What's going on? So then we started thinking here. Well, the Lamarckism, Coleman, Bondi coordinates give you a nice representation as to what the students are doing. But they use the, and this is our, we haven't taught a long time. We've had three of these things. They use the Lamarckism, Coleman, Bondi coordinates. Co-moving. The radial coordinates would be co-moving with the fluid, which is clear. What is moving with the fluid? So maybe you get a similarity in order to do it, to do that. And so we started thinking, what happens if we take our SOC fluid solutions and transform them over to these Bondi, the Coleman, Bondi coordinates? And we find there it is. We get an idea of the derivative and duplicity. So there are anomalous coordinate similarities in the second derivative, putting those derivatives. So the coordinate derivative, they're all saying, well, look, with the actual metric derivatives, it's very hard to expand the way we did around the planet. And the reason we didn't take time to discuss it. And so my guess is that, and they talk about the similarity. They're pretty appropriate. In fact, one paper wrote, if there isn't a singularity, you can't model the rate quickly for luminosity correctly. So we'll just be consistent with this because it looks like the group density is called the state of similarity. OK, so that's how we address that. So I have three more minutes. This is the end of the talk. Conclusion, our proposal, the anomalous deceleration is due to a local underdensity on the scale of the supernova data created by a self-similar rate from the radiation effort. There's no generals in that. But I'll just say, we've been thinking about this. Why would you expect to get decay with a self-similar rate from the radiation effort? Well, rays are coming in. And rays are going out. So if the rays are coming in faster than the prediction of decay, you can get decay. And to get decay, the simple way to know is if it's decaying faster than all the rays do, that's when you get a decay. And we have no simplified criteria arguments to indicate that that's the case. We kind of use the base focus of the Jupiter. But you have to close up the equation in a way that avoids the word normal for us. We don't have to write it up to do that. Not really. So that's the answer to that question. So I think you do get it. But it's been slow enough that you get feedback. Maybe that's the limit of how the decay happens. Anyway, the anomalous deceleration is due to a local underdensity on the scale of the supernova data created by a self-similar rate from the radiation effort that triggers an instability in the standard model in the course of galaxy years. We've made no assumptions regarding the space time far from the center of the perturbation. We don't feel obligated to solve all of the problems of cosmology in one grand solution involving this instability. We focus on this, and we believe that is valid. And to require the community that all of cosmology must be assumed is a friend of nobody. We have made no assumptions regarding the space time far from the center. So we think this is arguably the simplest explanation for the anomalous deceleration of the galaxy to reach within Einstein collision time without requiring dark energy. But we remain, what is the space time far out that this explains? It demonstrates that any local center of the standard model of cosmology is unstable to perturbation by its vast weakness from the radiation effort. The perturbation gets stabilized by the nearby stable wet point that generates the same kind of simple plasticity and emits a testable prediction. So on what scale would such waves apply? You wouldn't expect the waves from radiation to go all the way out to infinity. You'd expect them to apply on some scale, but there could be secondary waves. Waves coming out of the product waves, that's just one wave in there. 
Uh, it came from Synapse Synthetic Waste having contained in an earlier puppet with the acceptable really transition to waste, far from the sun. How does cosmology address the instability? Can dark energy stay guarded? No, dark energy is an obvious reason. The Friedman state came with dark energy, just as I stated. So you have a, a perturbed space structure that's almost exactly the same as the end of radiation. What's the, what are the implications of a per perturbed planet? And is this model more fine-tuned than dark energy? Dark energy is fine-tuned, the being near a center is fine-tuned, or more fine-tuned. And you know, I have to ask this question. Was it even reasonable to expect this group, the worst case group, to be in the actual relation of the skin and the model if you were looking out from an unstable center? It's like expecting to see the center when sitting in the room and wondering why the star column is, is not in the chart. Uh, Stable solutions are usually considered unobservable at first. Given that the phase portrait applies to any cool spherical perturbation, could an expected observed and anomalous acceleration in the nearby galaxy show any nearby measurement to expect to see them? And I, I just want to read this. If you give me one more minute, uh, this is a response to Jeff Berlin. The purpose of our paper is not to solve all of the problems in technology and one grand solution. Rather, our purpose is to introduce and deconstruct a new instability in the Friedman state function of the standard model of cosmology to identify mechanisms that trigger it, that show how it naturally could account for the anomalous acceleration of the minor planet of visible size without dark energy, and then could be argued to get to the center and therefore succeed in the So it's interesting that uh, astrophysics, who, who, who study large scale anomalies, there are even large scale anisotropies in the background of radiation. So we, the universe is not perfectly uni uh, uniform. How do we read or to make it do with this? At any rate, final comment. Every aspect of the work came from applied mathematics. And whatever its implications for physics, it stands on its own as a self contained model of applied mathematics. And here's my final slide. Arnold, Paris, 1997. Mathematics is part of physics. Part of physics where experiments are cheap. And there's my paper.